This program is brought to you by RTS on iTunes U from the Distance Education Department of Reformed Theological Seminary. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920. Now I want to uh, go back to the history of theology again. I want to look at uh, 19th century liberal theology, beginning with uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher. He's misspelled, actually, on that uh, outline. He should be Friedrich, not Frederick. Uh, F-R-I-E-D, Friedrich Schleiermacher. I remember when Cornelius Van Til walked into the classroom and there were blackboards all around, and he started with one blackboard over in that corner and started writing Friedrich with with huge letters, Friedrich Schleiermacher, and it extended all the way uh, past the end of the front of the room. Well, uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher has a long name, (laughs) that's for sure, but he's also a pretty important figure. He's sometimes called the father of modern theology, and when people say that, of course, what they mean is the father of modern liberal theology. He's not the first liberal. I've tried to show you that liberalism in theology, at least in my definition of liberalism, begins uh, in the middle of the 17th century, in the 1600s, with uh, Spinoza and Reimarus and Thomas Hobbes and others. Uh, But uh, in the 19th century, it takes a somewhat different tack. And here's Schleiermacher, who's coming along after the time of Kant. He's uh, influenced by Hegel, but he's not satisfied with Hegel. And uh, he's a very influential figure uh, in the history of uh, theology. You'll see a little bit about his background there under uh, uh, capital A. His father is a Reformed minister but uh, Schleiermacher was exposed to Moravian and Pietistic influences. In 1817, there was a union in Prussia between the Lutheran and the Reformed churches under Friedrich William III, and so there was call for ecumenism. There was a call, you know, if you have a united church, you need to have a theology for the united church. So there is a challenge to the theologians to try to get beyond the barriers of uh, the sectarianism, try to go beyond the uh, traditional Lutheranism and try to get beyond traditional Reformed Calvinism and try to come up with something that's uh, acceptable to both. Um, also, there, there, there's kind of an emphasis on... Uh, uh, free thought. There's a lot of people running around who don't believe in Christianity, or they uh, they they have some kind of Christian background, but they uh, uh, no longer are attracted to it anymore. They they, they they're coming to despise uh, Christianity. Uh, one of Schleiermacher's early books is called Speeches to the Cultured Despisers of Christianity. He wants to make Christianity more intellectually respectable. Uh, And I've told you, I hope, that this is a very grave danger for Christian theology. We saw way back with the Church Fathers how uh, Justin Martyr and others uh, compromised the uh, Christian doctrine of God uh, in, in order to make it sound more like Greek philosophy. Uh, And part of it was an apologetic motive, trying to show that uh, we have a lot of common ground with the Greeks, uh, trying to show that we're just as smart as the Greeks. And, of course, that kind of pride, that kind of of motivation influenced people like Clement of Alexandria and Origen, especially the great synthesizer of the early church. Uh, And... uh, uh, we've seen uh, that, that desire for academic respectability 
uh, affecting Thomas Aquinas, who brings Aristotle into the mix. We've seen it with uh, uh, the successors of the Reformers, who try to come up with a more academic brand of Reformation theology. And I think uh, uh, this almost always uh, brings harm to the church. Uh, I can't think of a single instance when, when the quest for academic respectability has brought good results uh, either to the theology of the church or to the apologetics of the church. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm a little bit biased uh, on this in some ways. But uh, Schleiermacher is definitely trying to uh, gain respect for Christianity by writing essays to the cultured among the despisers of Christianity. Also, as a theologian, he's unsatisfied with the earlier liberal theologies uh, with, with Kant and Lessing, uh, theology is turned into moralism, and Schleiermacher doesn't care for that. With Hegel, uh, theology becomes a, a kind of symbolic expression of philosophy, a uh, symbolic expression of Hegel's philosophy, and Schleiermacher doesn't like that either. Schleiermacher is, is convinced that the Bible, uh, Christian theology, is not just moralism, not just a form of, of philosophy, but it's something much greater, something much better than that. And he writes a book called The Christian Faith, which is a systematic theology, and it uh, goes into a lot of the traditional details, sort of like uh, Calvin, sort of like Turretin, he talks about the attributes of God. He talks about the Trinity. He talks about the person of Christ. He talks about justification and sanctification. He talks about all these traditional uh, doctrines. And as you look through the book, you might almost think that this is uh, uh, an orthodox systematic theology, sort of like Turretin or, or Fuchs or somebody like that. Uh, but... Uh, but it really isn't what it is as a liberal theologian, Schleiermacher, uh, applying the conservative drift. Schleiermacher's theology appears to be more conservative than that of Hegel, that of Kant, that of Lessing, that of uh, 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 the Enlightenment rationalists. Well, we'll see what he does here. Uh, he's trying so hard to be more credible than his pre predecessors and his allegiance to the Christian tradition. So there are two things he wants to do. He wants to be academically respectable. He wants to be accepted by the cultured people of his day who despise Christianity. But he also wants to be acceptable to the church people and talk about Christ, talk about the things that are on their hearts. And this leads to a very interesting amalgamation of rationalism uh, with uh, traditional Christian theology. And we'll see uh, a little bit of what he's doing. I want to look at his uh, Christian faith. Well, also to some extent the speeches uh, to the cultured despisers of Christianity. Uh, a couple of ideas that he presents that he became very famous for. One is his view of the essence of religion. What is religion really? And Kant says, uh, Lessing says, the essence of religion is, is morality. Uh, Kant basically agrees with that. The essence of religion is morality. Uh, Schleiermacher says no. Religion is more than mere, real, uh, mere morality. Religion is essentially a consciousness of God, okay? And he describes this with this phrase, difficult to say, difficult to translate, Gefühl Schlechtinigen Abhängigkeit, said that real fast so that nobody will find any fault with me, uh, a feeling of absolute dependence, all right? feeling of absolute dependence, feeling is the German word gefühl, uh, 
And the meaning of gefühl is somewhat disputed, shall we translate that feeling or emotion? But uh, dependence, something that you can literally feel? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, the word gefühl can also be translated intuition. And sometimes Schleiermacher seems to use it to mean the, the intuitive sense of the unity that underlies all the diversities of experience. And that's kind of like Hegel's, Hegel's idea of the absolute as underlying uh, all the differences, all the diversities, all the dialectic, all the different things that we find in our experience. Um, there, there's per perhaps something of uh, both of these in uh, Schleiermacher's thinking. He often uh, uh, is thinking in aesthetic terms when he uses uh, the word gefühl. Um, so it, it probably isn't too misleading if we translate it feeling, and I will usually uh, do that. I'll usually say feeling when I see the word gefühl. Well, feeling underlies all human thought and culture. Uh, all art, poetry, uh, thought, as well as religion. Uh, it uh, does not include propositional information directly, but, uh, you know, you, you think about your feelings. And as you think about your feelings, uh, you, you, you ask, well, what was I feeling there? And you try to describe what you're feeling, and that can lead to thoughts and ideas and propositions uh, about your feelings. Uh, religion, therefore, is not reducible to ethics or philosophy. It has its own distinctive basis, its own particular feeling. So religion starts this way. You, you have this feeling that you're absolutely dependent on something else. You have the feeling, I'm not independent. I don't know, Kant probably, I don't know if Kant had that feeling. Kant probably thought he was independent <laughs> as anybody could be. But Schleiermacher says, look at yourself, you're not independent. You're, you're dependent on, on this world to serve, to supply your needs. You're dependent on other people. And, and this gets mystical after a while. You're dependent on something huge, uh, some huge reality that you can't really describe. And all religions try to articulate that feeling in various ways. Uh, none of the religions are false, but all of them are more or less incomplete. But Schleiermacher believed that Christianity is the best. Uh, Christianity is the best religion at articulating, explaining, responding to this feeling of absolute dependence. Uh, Schleiermacher says Christianity is the religion in which the sense of dependence is defined by faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, all right? And so it's a feeling that uh, in Christ my sins are forgiven, okay? And that's such a wonderful thing. So, so for in Christianity, the feeling of absolute dependence takes on an ethical flavor. It's not just that there's this big reality up there that, uh, that I'm dependent on, but it's that uh, I, I need forgiveness. And uh, I'm dependent, the one I'm dependent on is the one who forgives me. Uh, and, and that's where I get forgiveness. And I call that uh, one I'm dependent on, uh, Jesus Christ. The distinctives of Christianity, first, ethical monotheism. Absolute dependence is not materialistic or mechanical, but teleological. It's God showing us the law of our own being, okay? So you don't just, you know, just do what somebody else says. You, you discover in yourself the desire to live in a certain way, and it's God who frees you to do that. So it's not bondage to something outside yourself. It's autonomy that's discovering in yourself the resources to live a better kind of life. Uh, God showing us, it's kind of like Kant uh, saying that uh, uh, God has planted in us 
the ethical ideal. And Schleiermacher puts it differently. God has given us the law uh, of our being, the law that fulfills us, that makes us the best we can be. And salvation is what? Salvation is the fulfillment of this feeling. It's the fulfillment of uh, this uh, movement by which we fulfill the law of our being. It's the full development of our consciousness of God so that we become completely overwhelmed uh, by the reality of God. Now, what is theology? Theology is not the same thing as religion. Uh, Religion seeks to articulate the feeling of absolute dependence. Theology puts it into words, right? So Schleiermacher says Christian doctrines are accounts of the Christian religious affections set forth in speech. In other words, you have this feeling of absolute dependence. And then you try to explain that. You try to describe it. And you try to describe what you're dependent on. You know, you have some, some sense of this being beyond you. And you try to describe that. Now, Schleiermacher proposes a canon for dogmatic statement. This is a rule. If you want to write theology, this is the rule that you have to follow. He says, we shall exhaust the whole compass of Christian doctrine if we consider the facts of the religious consciousness. That's the feeling, the gefühl. If we consider the facts of the religious consciousness, first as they are presupposed by the antithesis expressed in the concept of redemption, And secondly, as they are determined by that antithesis, (laughs) I I wanted to quote something from Schleiermacher. That's what he sounds like. That's the way he writes. So I wanted to edify you. I wanted you to see a little bit about what he sounds like. And I also wanted at the same time to discourage you so that you would never read Schleiermacher again. <laughs> probably, I hope when you hear that you'll say to yourself, I never want to read another sentence from that man. Uh, but that's uh, the way he writes, and uh, uh, you have to be warned about that. You know, we shall exhaust the whole compass of Christian doctrine if we consider the facts of the religious consciousness, first as they are presupposed by the antithesis expressed of the concept of redemption, secondly as they are determined by that antithesis. Okay? Uh, well, what he wants to do, I'm going to try to put this in different words, I hope, on each subject as you're writing your theology, look at the chief opposing views. For example, uh, uh, the op- op- opposition between Catholicism and Protestantism, between salvation by grace apart from works and salvation by faith together with works. Um, So uh, look at those opposing views or the opposition between orthodoxy and enlightenment. Okay, Uh, the difference between the deists and uh, and the orthodox. Seek to resolve the problem by going back to the religious consciousness which both parties are seeking however fallibly to articulate. So here you have religious, uh, here you have Roman Catholicism, here you have Lutheranism, and they disagree very sharply. Uh, What do you do? Well, you know, your goal ought to be to bring them together, right? Uh, To to have a world theology. Uh, So how how do you do that? Well, you say, you know, you Roman Catholics, uh, you know, you're trying to articulate uh, your doctrine of grace and salvation, and that's fine. But what, what basically you're trying to do is to express your sense of absolute dependence before God. And you Lutherans, you're, you're, you've got all this stuff about justification by grace through faith alone. But what you're really trying to do is to put into words this absolute dependence that you have on God. And when you get down to this level, The Catholics and the Protestants are the same. So, you know, you can just kind of get rid of that verbiage and and confess the sense of absolute dependence and put it into your own terms. 
And you can do that with anything. You can do that with uh, uh, Reformed versus Lutheran views of the Lord's Supper and so on. Um, so seek to resolve the problem by going back to the religious consciousness. And then you can come up with a formulation that's acceptable to both parties. Well, lots of luck, Schleierbacher. <laughs> I've been trying to bring parties together through for 44 years or so, uh, and uh, I, I don't think that's really possible. But uh, anyway, uh, that's what he tries to do. Let's look at what he says about several subjects. First, the subject of revelation. For Schleiermacher, uh, experience or feeling is the ultimate standard for theology, and in that sense, it's the ultimate form of revelation. This is Christian consciousness or Christian experience. But Christian experience, of course, interpreted by Schleiermacher's concept of general religious experience. Schleiermacher says that revelation cannot consist of concepts or propositions because God is beyond all concepts, though he is presupposed by them. Now, it's very interesting, as we go through this history of liberalism, to consider this question of propositional revelation, right? Propositional revelation is simply God giving us information, God giving us propositions. A proposition is an item of information. God giving us information about himself, about salvation, and about us, and so on. Does God give us propositional information? Now, the one thing that's very clear about liberal theology, but orthodox theology has no problem with this at all. Uh, orthodox Catholicism, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, Lutheranism, uh, Calvinism, uh, Anabaptism, Pentecostalism, uh, these have no problem with the idea of God coming and telling me something, God giving me information, God giving me propositions. That's no problem, okay? Uh, but the thing about liberalism is that liberalism wants to substitute human autonomy for divine revelation. Liberalism doesn't want to observe Scripture as their final authority. They want to follow the, the human mind as their final authority. So liberalism will have nothing to do with propositional revelation. They simply do not believe that God comes and gives us propositional knowledge. Now, it's interesting as you go through this history to look at all the different arguments they give as to why God does not give us propositional revelation. Uh, the arguments differ, but they all come to the same conclusion because that's the whole point of liberalism, to try to come up with a form of Christian theology in which the human mind is autonomous. Okay. And uh, we, we saw that way back with Enlightenment rationalism. Uh, the Enlightenment rationalists uh, favor natural revelation, but they deny special revelation. Why? Well, because they don't want to believe that God speaks to us. Uh, they want to believe that God reveals himself in nature and that we can figure it out. We can figure it out autonomously. But they don't want to believe that God gives us written words that we have to believe and we have to obey. And that's uh, the same is true when you get to uh, Lessing. Lessing uh, has this big ditch here, and so he wants to say there's a dichotomy between uh, uh, historical facts and rational theology. And uh, so... Uh, there can be no miracles. Miracles can have no influence upon our thinking as Christians. The Bible is a miracle. And so this is, this is Lessing's argument for saying that uh, there can be no propositional revelation. If God spoke to us 2,000 years ago, we couldn't know that today. And so we'd have to uh, think it through on our own.
Kant's book, Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone, Kant's book is a sustained polemic against propositional revelation. That's his whole point. His whole point is that we must think autonomously about God. We must never allow our thinking to be controlled by anything outside ourselves. We can never do anything because somebody else tells us to do it. All right? Uh, th that's Kant. Now we come to Schleiermacher. Well, Hegel, of course. <laughs> With Hegel, it's obvious. We, we, we don't uh, come to know God because of the Bible. Uh, the Bible is just a, a human book. It's a set of symbols uh, that tells us about God. But in order to unpack the symbols, you need a philosopher like Hegel. Uh, so it's impossible for God to give us propositional revelation. Now we're going to see, as we carry on this history, as we move from Schleiermacher to Ritschel to Hermann to Harnack to Barth uh, to Bruner to Bultmann, they all oppose propositional revelation no, no matter how orthodox they sound no matter how far they follow the conservative drift, they never become conservative enough to say that we must believe this because God has told us to believe it, or we must do this because God has told us to do it. That's, that, that, that's, uh, where, that's what distinguishes all liberal thought from all orthodox thought, and it's a sharp line. People sometimes try to fudge it over a little bit, but it's, it's basically a very sharp line. Either you uh, believe the Bible as the standard for your thought and your action, or you don't. And liberals are people who, who don't, even though they try to maintain some aspects of Christianity. So for Schleiermacher, uh, God cannot uh, give us propositional revelation because revelation comes in the form of feeling or experience, not in the form of words, not in the form of concepts or propositions. In fact, Schleiermacher says that God is beyond all concepts. Uh, so uh, God cannot be described in, in concepts. Even if he tried to speak to us, he couldn't do so because he wouldn't have concepts that refer to him. Revelation is never given in the abstract, but uh, objectively, or objectively, but it is always for us. Revelation is never directly given. Revelation is never something external. Uh, so uh, Schleiermacher rejects revelation uh, that uh, is propositional in character and comes through written words. Number two, Schleiermacher also rejects natural theology. Uh, he doesn't uh, agree with the uh, um, he doesn't agree with the Enlightenment rationalists and their theistic proofs and so on, because that's not religious enough. Uh, that's uh, see to be religious, you need to focus on feeling. You need to focus on your fool. Now, what about scripture? Uh, we do, uh, you know. Obviously, Scripture exists. You may or may not want to obey it. You may or may not think that it's the Word of God. But there is such a thing. And what are you going to do with it? Schleiermacher says, the Scriptures have arisen out of the Christian religion. They are themselves a human attempt to express religious affections in words. See, that's what, what Isaiah is trying to do. He has a profound feeling of God. He has a profound feeling of being absolutely dependent on God. And so he writes a book, and his writing the book is, is, a, is an articulation of that, an attempt to describe that feeling. You may or may not find that plausible. I mean, if you actually read the book of Isaiah, it doesn't sound much like a description of feelings. But anyway, uh, that, uh, that, what, uh, I mean, probably Isaiah would have said, no, that's not what I'm doing. I'm, I'm setting forth the word of God. But Schleiermacher would say, oh, you think you're setting forth the word of God. What you're really doing is expounding your feelings. 
Well, when we try to expound our feelings, of course, we, we make errors. And so we can assume that the scriptures do contain errors. Nevertheless, Schleiermacher says, Christian theology is restricted to the scriptures in one sense. See, he's trying to be conservative. No dogmatic statement can be accepted which cannot be derived from scripture in some way. Scripture defines that content which is definitively Christian. So Schleiermacher is conservative. He is uh, presenting us the scriptures as a positive, uh, in, in that technical sense, positive starting point for theology. Uh, then he also talks about tradition and uh, confessions, and we'll, uh, you can read, read what we say about that. I want to go on to what he says about God at the bottom of the page uh, under F. God in the first instance, and he's talking about the term God, the word God, in the first instance signifies for us simply that which is the co-determinant of that feeling. Okay, first of all, you find yourself sitting in a, on a beach on a starry night. You think, man, I'm just absolutely de dependent on something larger than I am. And at first, it's kind of a mystical feeling. It's a sense that you can't give words to. But then you say to yourself, I need a name for that on which I'm absolutely dependent. And the best name that I can think of is the name God, okay? <laughs> so that's what God is. God is a name for that being on which we are absolutely dependent. Now, from there, you develop your concept of God, and Schleiermacher does that uh, in a fairly traditional way. Interpreters find it hard to answer the question whether Schleiermacher is a pantheist or a theist. A pantheist, of course, is somebody who believes that God is the world and the world is God. A panentheist is somebody who thinks that the world is in God. Uh, process theology is panentheistic. Um, a lot of debate goes on here, but uh, Obviously, Schleiermacher wants to draw at least a religious distinction between ourselves and the one on whom we feel absolutely dependent, but maybe that's the universe, okay? There's a lot of pantheistic language in Schleiermacher, and it's not entirely clear what kind of distinction he wants to make between the creator and the creature, and that's something that we should not be unclear about. Is God personal? According to Schleiermacher, well, that too is problematic. He finds difficulties in personalistic language about God, kind of similar to those later expressed by Paul Tillich. Well, what are the attributes of God? Well, the attributes, the qualities that we uh, ascribe to God are expressions of our relationships to him. So if you love God, you describe God as love. Uh, if you uh, feel that God is, uh, has a lot of power, well, you describe him as a God of, of power. Um, then there's the Trinity, which comes in at the very end of the book. And people have often criticized Schleiermacher for bringing the Trinity in at the end of the book. I think that's wrong. I, I, I don't think there's any standard order in which we have to discuss doctrines of a systematic theology. As a matter of fact, uh, Frame describes the Trinity at the end of uh, his book, The Doctrine of God, so it can't be wrong. I think there are many way, many reasons that uh, people can have uh, for bringing a doctrine uh, in at the end, and it's certainly not to, to, to uh, put it down. Uh, and Schleiermacher himself says that the Trinity is the coping stone of Christian doctrine. But I'm not sure that he has an orthodox view of the Trinity. He says that his view of the Trinity is derived from the doctrine of salvation, and the Trinity represents different ways in which God re relates to man in the wor world. Uh, 
the Father, uh, he relates to man as the creator, the Son, he relates to man as the forgiver of our sins, the uh, Spirit, he relates to man as the imminent uh, uh, force uh, in nature, uh, and so on. So uh, I, I think that that uh, is, is not an adequate view of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, then he talks about man, and like uh, Kant, he believes that man is basically good. Uh, Kant says, you know, that we have this uh, moral ideal within us. Uh, Schleiermacher describes that as a predisposition to good, but he, he doesn't want to be moralistic uh, like Kant. Uh, so the predisposition to good is really a feeling. It's the inalienable God consciousness. And, and uh, we can't get rid of that. I mean, that's part of being a human being, that you have that consciousness of God. But unfortunately, there's something that contradicts that consciousness of God within you. And uh, Schleiermacher calls that sin. Now, what is sin? Sin is not a violation of a particular divine command. That would be a kind of sort of like propositional revelation, right? Revelation coming from outside me, telling me what to do, and I disobey it. Uh, we can't allow that. Uh, so what is sin? And by the way, all liberals uh, try to get away from the idea of sin as a violation of law uh, for the same reason that they try to get away from propositional revelation. They don't believe uh, that uh, we are responsible to something outside ourselves. Um, so sin is not a violation of law, certainly not a command in history. There's the there's Lessing's Ditch. Uh, we can't govern our conduct by something that happened 2,000 years ago. Schleiermacher thinks it's arbitrary to believe that man's eternal life or destruction can be made contingent on one decision made by one man at one moment of time, Adam, okay, in, the, in Genesis 3. So with that stroke, he wipes away the story of the fall uh, our life and death can't be based on a historical incident. So uh, Schleiermacher is doing the same thing that Lessing does. But what is sin? We, we, we do have this problem within ourselves. And what is it? Well, says Schleiermacher, you can define sin as sensuous consciousness. What's that? Well, sensuous consciousness is a preoccupation with this world rather than with God. So it's the opposite of our religious feeling. Our religious feeling is a sense of our a sense of God, a sense of our absolute dependence on God. Sin is turning away from that feeling and becoming preoccupied with things uh, here on the earth. Um, a matter of focus. <laughs> focus on the finite rather than on the infinite. I could say a few things about that, but I won't. Sin, in this sense, is part of man's original constitution. Um, sin is not something that happened to man in history. Sin is something that we've had since creation. God put it into us. Uh, sin is just part of humanity. Uh, now, remember that if sin came into the human race through the historical disobedience of Adam, then sin is not a part of our essential, our, our essential humanity. And we can be human beings without it, we can be forgiven our sins, we can have our sins taken away from us, and we can still be authentic human beings. The problem, if you deny the story of Adam, if you deny the historicity of the fall, what happens is that sin becomes part of humanity. Sin becomes part of our definition. And uh, sin, therefore, uh, is something that we really can't get away from. But uh, on Schleiermacher's view, there is no man who is perfect. And when men first came into the world, we were not fully developed spiritually. And our biological and intellectual development has proceeded more rapidly than our spiritual and moral development. Uh, 
and the discrepancy between these is sin. So, uh, uh, but of course, this is only not yet. I mean, we are destined to be perfect, uh, perfected. We're destined to overcome sin. So sin is not negative. It's not no, but it's not yet. Christ is the one who anticipates our future state. In Christ, you have a perfection of the God consciousness. Sin is understood only as a privation of good. Remember that uh, phrase of Augustine. Therefore, our basic goodness continues despite sin. Now, what about Christ? Well, again, you have to distinguish between Jesus of Nazareth and what Jesus of Nazareth symbolizes. You have to distinguish between the historical Jesus and the Christ who saves us from sin. The historical Jesus uh, actually lived years ago. Schleiermacher doesn't doubt that. And what, what is special about the historical Jesus? He had this religious feeling. He had this God consciousness in a unique measure, much more than any of us. But he was crucified. Now, what do we make out of the crucifixion? What do we make out of the resurrection? The ascension, the return of Christ. Schleiermacher says that he believes in these. And these are important uh, to the doctrine of Scripture. That is, Scripture is not infallible, but, but it's pretty important. So we can't uh, just get rid of these doctrines which are so central to Scripture. But Schleiermacher says... These doctrines about historical events are not important to our understanding of the person of Christ. That is, we can believe in Christ without believing in his crucifixion or resurrection or even knowing about those things. Redemption does not come through these historical events. Remember, uh, Lessing again, the big ditch between historical events and faith. Redemption does not come through historical events. Those are external, those are accidental, those are artificial theories. Redemption only comes through Christ in us, all right? And so we pro progress onward to number two, Christ is Savior. Christ is our example, but more than that, he is the archetype of what man essentially is in union with God. He's the archetype of true humanity, which is inalienable God consciousness. And therefore, Christ embodies possibilities that are inherent in human nature. And Christ is basically there to show us what we can be, to show us what we can become, to show us that we can be uh, people who are constantly in touch with God, who are constantly filled with this feeling of absolute dependence. As such, Christ anticipates our future state because we're all going to become like Christ eventually. Christ is sinless. What do we mean by that? Well, again, we're not thinking primarily of his historical existence, but we're saying that there is no, that he's, he's just full of this essential God consciousness. And there's no sin in essential God consciousness. Sin is the opposite of the God consciousness. So in Christ, uh, God consciousness fills him to the brim and there's no room for sin. So we confess the sinlessness of Christ, not as a historical conclusion, but as an analysis of the Christian religious feeling concerning Christ. We, we think to ourselves, Christ is so wonderful, Christ is the embodiment of the God consciousness, and therefore there can be no sin in him. Then Christ bears our sins. What does that mean? Again, it can't refer to a historical event. Uh, that would be external, that would be artificial. These words keep popping up in Schleiermacher, and we'll see them popping up in other theologians, too. 
uh, the idea, the traditional idea of the atonement is external. Uh, it's uh, uh, artificial, an artificial theory. Uh, 1924, you know, there was the Auburn Affirmation where 1,200, was it, Presbyterian ministers signed a document saying that the substitutionary atonement of Christ was a theory that can't be made binding on, on ministers in the church. Uh, well, uh, that's the rhetoric. The substitutionary atonement is an artificial theory, and Christ saves us, but these are just theories about uh, what he does. Well, that's uh, nobody can be made to hold a, an artificial theory. But what happens? Christ is the, is the archetype of religious feeling within us. And within us, he sympathizes with our imperfect condition. It hurts him to be in, in, in a person together with that sinful, sensuous consciousness. And so uh, there's a conflict between him and the sensuousness, between Christ and sin, that conflict within us. And eventually, it's Christ who prevails in the battle. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, Christ bears our sins. But he bears our sins through suffering, through that battle that he participates in. Salvation comes through grace. What does that mean? Well, we are all elect in Christ because we all have Christ's God consciousness within us. And we are created for that God consciousness. Well, we can go on and on with this, but you see what happens. In Schleiermacher's book, The Christian Faith, uh, he takes up all of the traditional doctrines, uh, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of election. I, I didn't spend time on that, but there's a lot in Schleiermacher's book about election, uh, the, the, the incarnation, the, the atonement, the resurrection of Christ, all of that is in there. The work of the Spirit, all of that is in that book. But you see, it's turned on its head. It sounds very orthodox, but it's all about our feelings. It's all about our consciousness, our feeling of God, and trying to fill us up with good godly feelings and, and let that uh, strain out of us our preoccupation with the world. That's all it is. And it's, a, it's a really, a, again, another way of turning the gospel of grace, turning the biblical gospel into a gospel of works righteousness. That's what it is. Well, that's the father of modern liberal theology. Now, the next uh, theologian I want to talk to, talk about, <laughs> I don't want to talk to him, actually, uh, the next theologian I want to talk about is uh, Albrecht Ritschel. And you'll notice that uh, Schleiermacher lived at the beginning of the 19th century. Ritschel lives toward the end of the 19th century. And uh, quite a bit has happened since that time. We're going to see that Ritschel sounds even more conservative than Schleiermacher. Uh, conservative, uh, you know, Schleiermacher sounded more conservative than, than Kant, Kant more than the Enlightenment rationalists. So there's this progress toward more and more conservative sounding words. But no basic change in the liberal gospel. Uh, the liberal gospel is uh, human autonomy in place of scripture. It's human effort uh, in, in place of God's grace. It's uh, improving our moral standard uh, and Christ only as a symbol of our self-improvement. Okay? And uh, that is turning the gospel on its head, taking the gospel of grace, turning it into works, works righteousness. Now Albrecht Ritchell. Ritchell wants to get beyond uh, these previous um, theologians. He doesn't like Kantian moralism, although he's deeply influenced by Kant. Uh, 
and probably closer to Kant than Schleiermacher and Hegel were, uh, deeply influenced by the Kantian phenomenal numinal scheme, more than with Schleiermacher. Um, ritual is opposed to speculation. Now, in the middle of the 19th century, there were a lot of uh, biblical scholars and theologians who uh, uh, followed Hegel, and they developed their theology in threes, the way Hegel did. Um, and Ferdinand Christian Bauer, for example, was a New Testament scholar, and he said, well, you have the, the thesis in, in Plato, or you, you have the thesis in Peter, and you have the antithesis in Paul, and then you have Luke, the, the synthesis, bringing them together. Uh, well, that's the kind of stuff that uh, uh, you, you get uh, among he he Hegelian theologians in the mid-19th century. Well, Ritchell doesn't like this. He, he doesn't like bringing philosophy uh, into theology. So he, uh, he doesn't like any kind of philosophy. At least that's what he says. He doesn't particularly like the doctrine of the Trinity because he thinks the doctrine of the Trinity is, uh, uses the terminology of Greek philosophy and it brings Greek thought into uh, the Christian faith. So he doesn't like that. He doesn't like the, the uh, philosophical terms for the person of Christ, that Christ has two natures in one person. Uh, he doesn't like the idea of the pre-existence of Christ, which he thinks is a, uh, comes from Greek speculation. Uh, all of these he describes as general ideas unconnected with revelation. So his slogan is, back to Jesus by uh, scripture and the Reformation. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Back to, Je back to uh, Jesus by scripture and the Reformation. And this is the conservative drift in ritual. Uh, all of us could say that, right? We want to go back to Jesus. We want the, uh, the real Jesus uh, to be the focus of our worship and the focus of our attention. And we want to do that on the basis of Scripture. What Jesus do we want? We want the Christ of Scripture. And how do we interpret the Scripture? By the Reformation, by Luther and Calvin. So that sounds as though ritual, what ritual is going to do. He doesn't like Schleiermacher. He doesn't like to start with Christian consciousness or feelings. He wants to go back and look at the historical facts. It almost sounds as though he wants to get beyond uh, Lessing and, and go back and, and uh, erase that big ditch and go back and look at the original historical Jesus. And indeed, that's what he tries to do. You've heard the phrase, the quest for this, the historical Jesus. Uh, that's what Ritchell and his disciples, like Hermann and Harnack, uh, are trying to do, to find the real Jesus, to find the historical Jesus. Of course, he's doing that through autonomous historical scholarship. He's not letting the Bible determine uh, his conclusions there. He's trying to think autonomously, but using this autonomous thought to get back to the real historical Jesus. Now, you'll sometimes hear people talk about the older liberalism as opposed to neo-orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy is the view of Barth and Bruner and Bultmann, and we'll talk about that later on. Uh, the older liberalism... Of course, the oldest liberalism is back in, uh, well, it's at the Garden of Eden, but <laughs> the oldest liberalism is back in the 1600s at least. Uh, but uh, when, when people today talk about the older liberalism, they're usually talking about Schleiermacher, and his, I'm sorry, they're usually talking about Ritchell and his disciples, Hermann Harnack. Um, this is the older liberalism. This is the liberalism that J. Gresham Machen talked about in his famous book, Christianity and Liberalism. And every seminary student ought to read that book. It's a very good book, very cogent, very clear. And uh, although it's talking about a somewhat outdated form of liberalism, it's talking about Richleyanism, 
uh, Machen's book is still very good at getting to the root of what liberalism is from 1650 down to the present. So uh, you don't dare go into the ministry without reading Machen's book. Uh, uh, it will tell you many things that you need to uh, uh, live with the present day forms of liberalism, uh, the, the ones that Machen never saw, uh, as well as the older forms of liberalism. But Ritchell uh, represents the older liberalism as opposed to the neo-orthodoxy of Bart and Bruner. Well, uh, his, his impact is that the older liberalism of the 19th and early 20th centuries is more directly influenced by Ritchell than by Schleiermacher. And of course, Hermann and Harnack were both known as Richlians. Bart, uh, in his book Protestant Thought from Rousseau to Ritchell, uh, Bart uh, respects Schleiermacher, but he doesn't respect Ritchell very much, and that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. The preceding program has been brought to you by RTS on iTunes U and may not be reproduced or disseminated in part or in whole for sale or for profit without express written consent. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920.